these Geneva stripes are a real mark of quality and because, and that's, that's quite, I think it's interesting, if you think they are producing uh, a watch movement, same as here. Everything is finished, it's running properly, all the jewels are in place, then they have to take it apart, then to mill these stripes in the top material then they have to rhodium plating thank you do again do the rhodium plating it's a, a huge extra steps in production but the positive side on that okay it looks amazing but always if everything in watchmaking if it's aesthetics it had original had a um, use and the use of these Code to Geneva is that the parts are not interchangeable because the angle of the, the lines are slightly different with every single produced movement. It is done uh, before assembly. So if this part is defective and you got another movement, it will fit, but you will see it's not original anymore. So this Code to Geneva is a real mark of originality. All parts are still the same. And I think that's, and even with this new wristwatch of Owen, it's still there and it's still an, uh, a mark of high quality watchmaking. Chronometer works best lying horizontal because this is the balance wheel and goes back and forth. And John Harrison really improved the, the workings of this. If it's horizontal, gravity is pushing with the same force all over this balance wheel. But if it's like this, and if there's a heavy point in the balance wheel, just think of the, the front wheel of your bicycle. If there's a heavy point, it will go downwards. And that makes a complete mess of the accuracy of a watch. So that adjusted to in six positions between one, two, three, four, five, six. That means that this movement is tested well the same as um, Owen's watch in all different positions it has to be accurate and that's Kadran the dial up dial down crown position 12 3 6 and 9 so the more positions it has been uh, adjusted to the more accurate a watch is. But there's something else really interesting with a chronometer. And it is, I will show you a very small clip about uh, navigation at sea. And then I will tell you a bit more some of the features on every marine chronometer. And the difference between um, a post and railway chronometer and a marine chronometer and there's a huge difference in there so i'll show you a small clip about navigation and uh, back in just a few minutes the early ocean voyages were probably big mistakes a vessel could be thrown off course by a sudden storm or error by the helmsman so how did the early sailors navigate the oceans Long before the magnetic compass reached Europe, the Vikings were sailing across oceans to both the east and west, discovering new lands in the west such as Iceland and Greenland, and even discovering America, nearly 500 years before Christopher Columbus. These brave Vikings were creative in compensating for their lack of technology. Floki Vilgerdarsen, a great Viking explorer credited with the discovery of Iceland, carried aboard a cage of ravens. When he thought land should be near, he would release one of the birds. If it circled the boat without purpose, 
land was not near. But if it took off in a certain direction, the boat followed, knowing the bird was headed toward land. The early Pacific Polynesians were the first to use the motion of the stars, weather, the position of certain wildlife species, or the size of waves to find the path from one island to another. Using the motion of stars? Imagine one night you call a friend who's a few thousand miles away and ask them to name the star which is directly over their head. You could then find that star in the night sky and the point on the horizon directly below that star would be their exact direction from you at that moment. Unfortunately, a few minutes later that star would have moved and so you'd need a new one. With this method, it would take a lot of phone calls for every new star. Fortunately, there is one star in the night sky that does not appear to move. It's called Polaris, the North Star. The easiest method for finding the North Star is by finding the Plow, an easy to identify group of seven stars. It is known as the Big Dipper to the Americans and the Saucepan to many others. The Plow rotates anti-clockwise about the North Star, so it will sometimes appear on its side or even upside down. However, its relationship to the North Star never changes and it will always dependably point the way to it. The first useful invention to help was the magnetic compass. With that, you could hold a steady direction as you sailed. And with something called a dead reckoning, sailors estimated their ship's speed by noting the time it took for a wood chip, a bubble, or a piece of seaweed to pass along the length of their vessel. But since the time was measured with a sand glass, these early calculations were often way off. To determine a position on Earth's surface, it is necessary and sufficient to know the latitude, longitude, and altitude. Altitude considerations can, of course, be ignored for vessels operating at sea level. If you have a compass, know the date, and have a set of prepared navigation tables showing how high the sun should be at local noon, then you can determine your latitude easily. But to calculate your longitude, you need, oddly enough, a very accurate clock which is calibrated to Greenwich Mean Time, or GMT. Here's why. We know that Earth revolves about its axis once every 24 hours. In other words, the Sun completes its apparent revolution of 360 degrees in 24 hours. So in one hour, the Sun appears to move 15 degrees. In four minutes, it appears to move one degree. In one minute, it appears to move 15 arc minutes. In four seconds, it appears to move one arc minute, and so on. If you're sailing in its 1800 hours GMT, and the local time is 800 hours, then you get a time difference of minus 10 hours. Minus 10 hours is minus 150 degrees. Therefore, you are 10 hours behind GMT, which means your longitude is 150 degrees west. In 1714, the British government offered a prize to anyone who could perfect and demonstrate a clock that would be accurate enough over long voyages to give the desired precision in locating a ship. This type of clock was called a chronometer. But the problem was that all the clocks of the time were mechanical. They were upset by changes in temperature, humidity, vibration, corrosion, etc. In 1775, Captain Cook returned from a three-year voyage, having used one of the chronometers submitted by Larcom Kendall, which was a copy of the H4 clock made by John Harrison. Upon comparing it to local reference clocks, it was found to have been accurate to within eight seconds per day. Nowadays, of course, navigating is much simpler. All large ships today rely on global positioning system. Marine GPS receivers don't show streets, they give longitude and latitude, and typically also show maps of any nearby coastlines, harbors, lighthouses, etc. Many also display the approximate depth of the water as well. Many marine GPS units now have a man overboard button. If someone falls overboard, the captain or other crew member presses that button. The GPS unit then marks that spot in the ocean and typically displays a directional arrow pointing to it, along with a distance reading to that spot. That lets the captain turn the ship around and return to the spot where the person fell into the water. I suspect most ships even now carry a sextant, a handheld instrument used to measure angles between the sun and moon and horizon as a backup to their GPS systems. 
With that and an accurate wristwatch and navigation tables, a competent navigator can still find where he is on the ocean, even if the modern GPS unit fails. So when you're sailing, you might not save time, but time just might save you. A chronometer is a very accurate timekeeping device and you needed the accuracy for traveling over long distances. But because the sun at its highest, highest point at your place, that means that then it's 12 o'clock. If you travel over long distances, the 12 o'clock moment will differ. So you need very strict regulations how everybody is uh, behaving at a certain time. Um, so the only two at the time, the only two main reasons to have a chronometer was railway and uh, seafaring. That's it. And there's a huge difference between an, a post and railway chronometer. Spoor is railway in the Netherlands and a marine chronometer as we just saw and I will show you because a marine chronometer you cannot set the hands very easily the worst thing that can happen when using a marine chronometer is, also, is that somebody changes the hands during the journey uh, moves the hands it might be accurate but you don't know what time it is do you get that? So with a marine chronometer, there's, it's always difficult to set the hands. You have to push this bit and then this crown releases and then you can set the hands. But in no way you can just set the hand of uh, unlock this and set the hands. So with a marine chronometer, it's vital that there's an extra um, a safety catch. Yeah. So uh, no one can just change the hands because then it's accurate, but you don't know what time it is. With a railway chronometer, you have to have the time in a moving vehicle, the train or the post, but the clocks, uh, in railway stations were always very accurate and very early on um, electronic. So from a moving train and when you see the accurate time it's vital that just about the same uh, device but then you can change the hands. So with a railway watch, there's always a safety catch, but it's easier to change hands than a marine chronometer. Because once you have the accurate time, you don't want the hands to change. Marine chronometer. I got very kindly uh, on land uh, by Max. Let's have a look. It's Russian. And as we see by this scale, it's been 48 hours since it's, it was wound. And uh, the design is very functional and beautiful. On chronometers, because it was so important to have the accurate time at sea, that during the shift uh, that it had to be wound, with this power reserve uh, that you can see how long it was since it was wound then you can see if somebody has missed their shift and then kill halen so that's the function of this power reserve uh, so you can see when somebody missed their shift uh, to wound as you could see with the other chronometer it's vital uh, for the accuracy that the balance wheel is horizontal because gravity is pushing everywhere at the same time. 
kopje onder kiel halen. As you can see with this. Whatever you do on board of a ship, it's cardenic and will always stay level. And again, this is purely because of the function. At sea, you want the most accurate timekeeping, so that's it only when the movement is horizontal, because of the graphics.